Hello, everyone, and welcome to Film Independent Presents, our year-round screening and Q&A series. I'm Brian Sheehan with Film Independent. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk all things Last Night in Soho. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank some of our supporters, our lead sponsor, the HFPA, and our official partner, Vision Media. Today, we have a very special guest moderator, an acclaimed independent filmmaker, Allison Anders. And without further ado, I will let Allison take it away from here to talk all things Last Night in Soho. All right, Edgar, Christy, I'm so excited to talk about this movie, and um, which I love. I, I can't help it. I can't help but gush. I love it so much. And this is so rare for me to say. What brings you down then? I'm studying London College of Fashion. The room is on the top floor. It's perfect. I love it. If I could live any place and any time I'd live here. In London. In the 60s. Last night, I saw something in my dreams. Oh, so I was talking with our friends, Joe Dante and Josh uh, Olson about my favorite um, horror movies. And my favorite brand of horror movie, I was telling them is a woman being haunted by a ghost and where she's like, am I insane or am I seeing ghost? And everybody's like, yeah, you're insane. And then, and then it turns out, no, she is not insane. So um, now I'm gonna have to ask for them to let me reshoot it so that I can add this film to my faves. <laughs> um, I think that what it is, is it's a specific feeling of honoring a woman's intuition, you know, that there is like a really deep intuition so how did this story come about of this young woman being haunted? Um, and how did, uh, I mean, Edgar, you've always had really great female leads, but this is your first female protagonist. And how did you two come together to give us two great female characters? Well, the, um, there's so many sort of inspirations for the movie and um, like, I'll go through it quickly in terms of the sort of the key, the key things. Like, I guess like uh, one thing to talk about the female protagonist is, and is Eloise in a strange way is based on my mother a little bit because my mother is somebody that is like very supernaturally switched on. And certainly like growing up, like with my mom who would kind of feel presences and sometimes see ghosts and talk to my me and my brother very matter of factly about that. It wasn't something where I was ever like a skeptic. I would actually more um, maybe be slightly envious as a horror fan, that she, as a young horror fan, that she'd seen a ghost and I hadn't. But it's definitely something that I, 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 I grew up with that, but also, and I think about this a lot, that even though me and my brother weren't skeptical about it and wanted to believe her or did believe her, I also kind of knew enough to maybe not go to school and say, hey, my mum saw the ghost of a hangman in the living room because you know what other people would think. So, and my mum is still like, my mum who saw the movie the other day for the first time. I actually, Christy, you can talk about something that uh, my mum said to us. Um, but, uh, you know, I think my mum just maybe saw it kind of almost like a doc documentary. And then at lunch afterwards, after she saw the movie, she was just like retelling all of the stories that we'd heard as kids, you know, in, in, including her seeing two separate ghosts in our family house growing up. So that was one aspect of it. And, and, and one of the things in the movie that's kind of um, is sort of key to it is when Rita Tushingham and Thomas and Mackenzie talk about her power at the start, it's called a gift. But yeah. then anybody else's kind of like sort of response to it, um, especially, you know, it becomes something where it's kind of considered a mental illness, especially when you get to a scene where you've been with this protagonist the entire time you've seen what she's seen, you've experienced what she's experienced, but then when you get to like a key scene where she has to go and explain it to the cops, you know, like in a sort of cynical male police officer, obviously it sounds like the rantings of a mad person. 
so that was something that I think sort of having had that experience growing up is I was aware of like what I believed and also what other people might think and and you know maybe that's a sort of source of shame that I sort of like would believe my mum but not tell other people that I believed her. <laughs> and Christy share it share that story. Oh it was so good when we were I think it was quite early on in the writing room we were talking you know a lot about Ellie's gift and and sort of you know what are the rules of her powers and Edgar was obviously telling me about his mum and your mum sent us this word document called spooky goings on and it was just uh, her collections from the years all her recollections of what she'd seen and it was I mean, there was like a few movies in that at least it was great oh, I love it I love it yes I and I love this idea of the of this being a gift I mean she has many gifts she has a gift and then she's got her her um, gift that she can share, but even at that, it's complicated by people not quite buying it. You know, sort of the mean girls there at the at the uh, at the academy. Um, so, how did the how did you two come together to start writing this together? Well, I'll do the, the I'll do the short version of it because the sort of the film sort of existed in my head literally haunting me for maybe about a decade before I even met Christy or maybe like close to a decade but I'd just been thinking about this film for a long time and there'd been like a, a few sort of key things that had really inspired it one had been growing up like my obsession so I was born in 1974 so I have nostalgia for a decade that I did not live in and I think there's an L a sense that you have you know people have nostalgia for the decade they just missed Mm -hmm. And it, it started with my parents' record collection because they had one box. They only had one box of records, which I never saw them growing up ever play. <laughs> so I quickly <laughs> inherited them because it was like, well, if they're not listening to them, I'm going to listen to them. And they were 60s albums that seemed to stop dead when my older brother was born. Like no 70s albums. It was just like 60s albums. So I would obsess about the music and in the kind of like, in the sort of... Uh, for the older people out there who remember the times before the internet where there was nothing else to go on other than what you had in front of you. Like I would just listen to the albums and read all the small print and look at the pictures and, and form my opinion of the decade based on that. And then growing, and this is from like, I'm talking when I was like six years old, but then like through like film and TV and music and art and fashion, just this sort of idea that like, the, this the, the decade that I wasn't in was like the best time ever and like what an incredible time and then that would turn into sort of time travel fantasies about like frequently dreaming about going back to the 60s and you know and sort of having these kind of cultural trips back in time like if you were like wouldn't it be great to go back and be at that gig or go and see that film with an opening weekend audience or like be at that show or go to that club but um and the more that that started to kind of like plague me, you start to feel like, is this actually like, do I have a problem? Is nostalgia itself yeah. a, re a retreat from modern life? Am I retreating from dealing with the problems of the present day? So that was one big aspect to it. And the idea that then started to kind of, the idea of a theme of like the danger of romanticizing the past and the danger of like, if, if your wish came true and you could get to go back, like you can't have the good without the bad and that's essentially and then and then moreover and this is the kind of stuff where in dreams that become nightmares the idea of going back but not being able to do anything to change future events so she's not Eloise is not a time traveler like Martin McFly she can't change the outcome of the future she can only essentially watch and that at first could be a thrilling intoxicating thing and then when things get darker and you can't do anything to save somebody that becomes the nightmare and then i'm coming to christy <laughs> <laughs> the second part of it i'll get through this quickly the second part is just moving to london and moving to london and then living in london for 27 years and spending the majority of my time through work and socializing in soho because if you don't know soho in london it's the center of the film and tv industry it's sort of the center of show business it's like clubs you know, cinemas, theaters, everything, a big nightlife district, but also, um, you know, the heart of the underworld and the sex industry. That part of it has sort of been like mostly um, uh, kind of like, um, you know, kind of, is, is, is sort of has, has changed, but it, it's still there a little bit. 
Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's mostly been gentrified out, but not quite. And as, as Christy can, well, Christy can talk about her own experiences, but it's just something that Soho after midnight, it's almost like Brigadoon, the sort of the, the kind of the, the, the darker half comes back and it's kind of really sort of a, a, a weird and disturbing and compelling energy change in the area. So there was a big part of that, like being obsessed with the 60s, being back in Soho and just thinking about the ghosts of the past and being in buildings that are hundreds of years old and thinking about what these walls have seen. That was really preying on my mind. So I started to formulate the story. And then about a decade ago, I mentioned it to my producers, Naira Park and Rachel Pryor. They love the idea, but because it has a lot of darker themes than anything else I've done before, the first thing I wanted to do was research it. And because I was going off to do another movie, we hired this amazing researcher, Lucy Pardy, to mm -hmm. just want a BAFTA for the casting directing on rocks. She basically, whilst I was doing another movie, The World's End, she started researching it. And I had this like tome of like, almost like all my worst fears confirmed. Everything that I thought or kind of had heard second or third hand or even worse back in those days in terms of the darker side of show business, which has changed more recently, but like stories like that would be like malicious gossip. It wouldn't be like the victims themselves speaking. It would more be the things that like the kind of stuff that's in Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon. It feels like sort of like m sort of malicious gossip about sort of stories like that. So I I, I, uh, I had this research I, and, and as I was kind of thinking about doing it and I kept going off and doing other movies, then I met Christy um, through Sam Mendes. And I would now like to give the floor and let you tell the rest of the story. <laughs> Um, yeah, Sam introduced us because he, you know, like, quote, said, oh, you guys will get on like a house on fire, which um, was true. Uh, yeah. And uh, we met we met for the first time on the night that the Brexit vote had been passed through. So we were drowning our sorrows and we were in Soho drowning our sorrows. And we just happened to be drinking across from the strip club that I used to live above. And I mentioned, oh, I used to live above there. It was really noisy. Uh, and also I worked in a bar around the corner. And he was like, oh, I have this idea that's set in Soho, but it's set in kind of like, you know, not the glossy part of Soho, the seedier part. And I was like, oh, I know that world. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we went on, we went on a night out to like a lot of the sort of dingy bars and we ended up in the basement bar Trisha's uh, on Greek Street. And Edgar told me the entire story there, like over drinks. And I remember kind of sitting, just gripping the table, listening and just being carried away on this ride. Um, and I like instantly fell in love with it. I mean, just the whole story totally had me. Uh, and then it was about nine months later, I got a lovely phone call from Edgar saying, hey, do you remember that story? I was like, yeah, I kind of think about it every time I walk through Soho, which is about five times a week. Um, and then he was like, do you want to write it with me? And I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And then you flew back to London and he had a writing office in Soho. And I remember at cycling and I had the playlist already because that was sent to me as part of the, you know, uh, I had the playlist, uh, cycling into work, listening to the playlist arrived. And I, I mean, it's fair to say your office did look a bit like you were hunting a serial killer. It was like all these cards up in the wall. <laughs> so and I found out later you were worried that I was going to bolt. Um, but actually, that's my aesthetic because I'm a writer. So my house looks like I'm either a serial killer or trying to catch a serial killer. <laughs> we, just, we just sat and started to work on it um and I mean like you know I think six weeks we had the first draft wow that's awesome that's incredible and so were you writing in the same room this is always my big question you know so you wrote in the same room yeah that's the great. Room. at one point the people in the office next to us came and I think it was at the point where I'd played Sandy Shaw's puppet on a string three times in a row. So okay. Will you please turn it down? <laughs> I bro broke them with Sandy Shaw at one point. <laughs> By the way, totally love that she is named Sandy with an IE. I caught it immediately. And then when puppet on a string comes on, I was like, oh, please. I got this. You'll appreciate this story, okay. Aston. At one point, like whilst having a meeting about the movie at Working Title, who, who like produced the movie, they have these conference rooms with like glass walls. So I was like talking about the movie. I can't remember what we were talking about, whether it's like financing or casting or something, but I was distracted by somebody walking through the office. And I was like, and I just stopped and stopped what I was saying. And then I said, was that Sandy Shaw? 
<laughs> and Eric Fellner, the producer, said, oh, yeah, she's having a meeting with Tim. I said, Sandy Shaw's in the office. <laughs> like, it was like, it was so strange because we were like talking about this movie and then she kind of walked through like an angel. It was very- <laughs> Oh my so God. Like, that was a good omen. So good. I love that. I didn't see whether she was wearing shoes or not. <laughs> I was going to ask. I was going to ask. I couldn't see. I couldn't see. <laughs> Um, so you talked about the playlist, Christy, and, and I'm fascinated by the playlist as well, because I can't write. It's almost sometimes the song happens before the character for me. So I can't write without the playlist. And um, by the way, loving the playlist on Spotify and can't wait for the double vinyl LP. So um, how do you explain how that works for people who are just beginning writers or just or don't even know how that works? Well, I think in a weird way with this film, and, and it's been similar with some of my previous films like Baby Driver, with this film, it's like, I know I know what the story is and I know the kind of song that I want to be in it. And I, so I start to zero in on specific songs and particularly the female singers of the day, mm. Sandy Shaw, Petula Clark, Dusty Springfield, Cilla Black, because like those like songs of that time that even the sort of, like obviously the ballads, but even the more upbeat ones, they all kind of like sort of so like stained with tears. There's this mm -hmm. melancholic, bittersweet kind of edge to them that this felt like this is really within the tone of the movie. So that was a big part of it. And then it was other sort of like songs that kind of just like sort of just like felt that they kind of had like a kind of a, almost like a sort of ghostly evocative edge. Like I think like, Peter and Gordon's World Without Love that opens the movie. If it's an upbeat song, but it feels like a sad song. It feels like a sort of ghostly song to me. So it'd be a lot of those songs that would kind of kind of like hit me kind of in the sort of like the sort of the heart that there was something kind of like sort of very sad about them. And so, but in a way, as I was kind of coming up with the story long before Christy came on board, I would sort of maybe similar to you, Alison the songs had almost become like post-it notes, like you must yeah, make yeah. this movie. You yeah, don't, yeah. don't forget to make this movie. And then if those songs would come up, either like I'd hear them out in the world or they just come up on shuffle, I'd be like, oh my God. You know, I'd hear R. Dean Taylor's Ghost in My House saying, I have to make Last Night in Soho, yeah. you know? Um, can, I, can I mention how you come into it, Alison? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a story, this is, this is why, Having Alison moderate this Q&A is just like the, 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 the closing of the circle. So maybe as far back as like 2008, I was with Quentin Tarantino at his house and he just brought out Death Proof, which had Hold Tight by Dave D, Dozy Beaky, Mick and Titch in the film. And we were talking about that song and I said that I really love that song. And he, he said, have you ever heard Last Night in Soho? And I said, no, and he played it for me. And he said, this is, um, this is the best like end music for a film that doesn't exist. And that kind of stuck in my head. And I liked the song. And because I, in writing, I had started to amass this playlist of 60s music, British 60s music from a particular period that was maybe like 300 songs long. And then I got it down to like sort of like 70, which I, with the playlist would be called Soho Five Stars. So these were like sort of the kind of the ones that would start to form the soundtrack. <laughs> And within that group was now Last Night in Soho by Dave D. Dozy Beaky Mikitich. Then, like, I called the film a number of other titles. First, I had the, the working title was like Red Light or Red Light Area. And then um, and then I changed it to The Night Has a Thousand Eyes, named after the Bobby V song. Mm. And I found out that there was already a film called The Night Has a Thousand Eyes. And then eventually it was staring me in the face, Last Night in Soho, that's the title of the movie. So then I changed the title and I didn't, I hadn't spoken to Quentin for a while because he was making Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and it was announced in the trades. And the next time I spoke to him, I said, I said, hey, did you see the title of my new movie? And he says, yeah, Last Night in Soho. And I said, you're not mad at me that I like chose that title. He goes, you know what? I just thought if anybody can make a movie called Last Night in Soho, it's Edgar. And I said, well, I'm going to thank you at the end of the movie. He goes, hey, well, if you thank me, you have to thank Alison Anders because she's the one who said, who originally came up with the thing of Last Night in Soho is the best end titles, end title music for a movie that doesn't exist. So if you thank me, you have to thank Alison. And I'm like, done. 
So then if you saw on the thanks at the end, it says, and it, what's funny is that you're just alphabetically, you're both sides of the thanks list. It starts with you and it ends with Quentin. And then, <laughs> so much. And then I emailed Alison maybe like a couple of months ago to tell her that she was thanked at the end of the movie and explain why. And then you said, what's your address? And then you sent to me in London a seven-inch single of Last Night in Soho by Dave D. Dozy Beaky McTitch. <laughs> so I want to say on record in front of everybody, thank you, Alison Anders, for naming my movie. <laughs> oh, man. Now, I'm going to tell you something I haven't told you before, which was when I saw that you were making a movie called Last Night in Soho, my heart sank because I went, <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. And then I thought, but he'll never know that I gave Quentin that song. <laughs> and, you know, he'll never, I, and I'm never going to tell him that. And then you sent this to me and I couldn't believe it. It was just the most amazing thing, you know, that I got, that it came so beautifully full circle. And these guys were down for me, man. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> Just incredible. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you that when when that when I heard that those first notes of that f fucking amazing song come up over those end credits, I just bawled. I just wept. I wept <laughs> five times, but especially That's on that one. <laughs> you know what's funny? Quentin saw it the other day in London and he like said it made him cry like three times. Yeah. And I said, What bits made you cry? And he said, he said, when the Scylla Black song started playing. Like Me too, a, when she walks out. He said it was a double man. He said he started sniffling when Scylla Black like started singing. And then he really started bawling when he saw Scylla Black. <laughs> like, and then he said the next thing is he, 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 he the, the end without going too much into stuff just is mm -hmm. like, you know, in the end with kind of the revelation, you know, uh, at the end, like I'm really like sort of limit. And then, and then the final thing is he said, and then hearing Dave D. Dozy Beaky make a titch, like on the end credits made him cry. Unbelievable. So you're the same. So you guys are twins. We really are. We really are. And we had a whole Dave D. Do Dozy Beaky make and titch exchange of records for like about five or six years. And, um, and uh, yeah, it just, I'll tell you another, another point for me was just, yeah, there was, there's, a, well, no, I can't, um, but there was a beauty. Um, I, I had five different times that I, that I, uh, that I just was totally teared up. So, um, and I think that, you know, it's this idea too, that there's um, these two women looking out for each other. There's something about this sense of, um, of uh, you know, one thing that I've never seen really in a movie before is when Ellie's in the cab and she's feeling like, okay, I'm having a friendly conversation and then with the cabbie, and then she gets uneasy and then she gets scared. And that sense of trepidation um, for a young woman, or for an old woman, by the way, <laughs> you know, um, is uh, you had to walk such a fine balance of like not saying girls stay at home, but girls beware, and 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 showing what that experience is, is like for women of never quite knowing intentions. Um, male intentions. And I thought that was spectacular. And that by doing the two different time periods, uh, these women could have different experiences of that. How did you walk that line? Well, I think, you know, I think exactly what you said is exactly it. It's like in the previous scene, you know, like Peggy played by Rita Tashingham has, has warned her like mums or grandmothers do but then the cabbie scene, you know, I mean, it's definitely creepy, but that if that thing like sort of that you don't know and like, and it's deliberately left ambiguous and we don't need to kind of, is whether the cabbie is genuinely, I mean, he's obviously like malevolent, but right. like that cab driver, if he was kind of like drawn on it would say, oh no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Haven't you got a sense of humor? That kind of bullshit response. Or can I you mean, take a compliment? Can you take a compliment? Can you yeah. take a compliment, yeah. darling? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, smile more, you know, just yeah, like yeah. that kind of advice of, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you can, Christy, I mean, 
those, I mean, those lines yeah. you've heard out loud. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, the the sleazy pickup line in the bar, you know, we were sitting right one day. Edgar's like, what's the worst pickup line you've ever heard in the bar? And I was like, well, I got it right to hand. And it was like, oh, my dick just died. Can I bury it in your arse? Like that kind of thing. Or, and the taxi driver as well. I mean, I wouldn't say that was just one taxi driver and I don't want to tar the London taxi drivers because I still like to get lift places. Mm -hmm. But like over the years, like definitely had stuff had been said to me. I'd never, I never put anything in the script there in those scenes that hadn't been said to me or one of my friends. And I think it's like, it is one of those things like as a young woman moving through the city, especially a city like London, which has this kind of like, you know, undercurrent and, and just this fastness that you do feel uneasy. And I think, you know, really good horror stories should play on things that are actually frightening. And that stuff is actually frightening to me. Yes. It's like yeah. imbuing that into the script so that, you know, and that is frightening to men and women. It's not just women that are at prey, but I think most women would get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, and it underlies a lot of stuff and how we look out for our daughters and how we look out for our granddaughters or our sisters or our best friends. And um, you don't want to tell them, don't live your life, don't thrive, don't, you just want to go, but watch out. Be aware, be yeah, aware, be, aware. Is the part of be, thing, aware. Right? be pl plan for it. Yes, be, be empowered, but be aware, exactly. Yeah. It, it and, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, it's interesting. I was just reading, Rita Tushingham did an interview in The Guardian today about promoting the movie. And she watched it a couple of weeks ago. And obviously she's not in like the, the contemporary London scenes, she's not in the 60s scenes, right. but she was asked about like, what she thought about the, the the scenes in the 60s. And she said, she goes, oh no, I mean, there was a lot of that going on. There was a lot of young actresses being exploited. And we used to have a code word, D-O-M, dirty old man. Oh, watch out for him, he's a D-O-M. So it was interesting. And she sort of said, yeah, you know, you just had to keep your wits about you and kind of figure out who was like, who was trouble, but it was very difficult because they were everywhere. And I think that's one thing I was going to say about the 60 scenes as well, that we sort of like, in terms of threading the needle, the other equally disturbing part to it, to me at least, is saying Matt Smith's character is that, and he deserves no sympathy, but yeah. I think there's an element where Matt Smith's character thinks that he's doing the right thing, or rather not doing the right thing, but this is the way that it works. That terrible phrase of like, this is the way that it works. Right. So he like has that phrase, which is kind of like a horrible gaslighting phrase which has unfortunately been said to too many people and mm -hmm. not just in the 60s but the thing of like um everybody else is doing it what makes you so special yeah. so using the kind of the sense that like you're gonna lose out unless you do this thing is such a sort of a dangerous weapon to use against everybody like mind games and coercion but i, I think unfortunately that's a lot of what I want to say, I don't want to even use it in the past tense of saying that's what happened in the business. We right. unfortunately know too much that that continued way past the 60s, but Boy, the, writing those kind of lines was was, was writing sort of like a, a plausible lines, but also something that even Matt Smith's character in his head, you, you know that that character would never refer to himself as a pimp. Mm -hmm. You know that he would have fooled himself into thinking, I'm a manager. A manager, exactly. It's, it's the way that it works, you know? So that stuff was like, we, you know, we drew on some like sort of very dark stuff, um, both not just from like, um, you know, the research that had been done, but also just in terms of, you know, I guess playing on sort of on the contemporary problems as well. So, yeah. Yeah, it really, uh, it, it really comes off this way as well, because Ellie's having to dodge not the same stuff as Sandy, but she's having to dodge her own um, experiences of that, of exploitation. Um, well, we're getting toward the end, but I have to mention that we're all three, we all three went to London as young people. And there is, I mean, I was closer to this to the 60s than you guys were. I was there in 73. Um, but uh, but it was fascinating to think back. I mean, I lived in a counter, you know, with a bunch of counterculture English dudes, you know, but but I still, I remember coming home one day and saying, um, they were like, what'd you do today? And I was like, oh yeah, I went to the Tate and I went to a pub. And they were like, a pub by yourself? 
And like that wasn't done. And then I was like, oh, I guess that's why everybody was looking at me weird. I thought it was just because I was an American hippie girl, you know, but um, but it's strange that because, um, you know, in America, you could certainly walk into bars as a woman by yourself. But um, but it's strange how different the um, like there was a dark side and there was a repression that people don't think about in terms of the 60s and the 70s, God knows, because you think, oh, it was the ideal time and in, in London at the time. And it was this it was this, uh, you know, time of freedom. So how did you expect that was my dark side of London, not to mention my relationship at the time, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, how did you experience uh, that side of London as young people? Well, I mean, I think sort of like in terms of, I mean, my, my experience of coming to London was, you know, we use the phrase country mouse in the movie because I come from Somerset and coming to London as a 20 year old, you know, it's such a sort of forbidding experience just in terms of, um, oh, how am I going to fit in? I'm not rich enough, I'm not cool enough, I don't know anybody, how can I possibly make a foothold in this, you know, London can be a very cold and hard city, like, initially, and some people never crack it. I think, um, I think the other thing was just to touch on what you said was interesting, was, um, you know, I, I think, uh, what was interesting as well is that, you know, Diana Rigg at one point told me, you know, said the story when when we were like sort of on the set, I happened, she's not in the Cafe de Paris scene, but like I happened to mention that we, the Cafe de Paris was a set that Marcus Rodens did, a sort of recreation of the 60s version. It's like an incredible set. And I said, I said, oh, we, you know, we got the Cafe de Paris sit there. And Diana Rick said, oh, I went to the Cafe de Paris on my 18th birthday and I saw, saw Shirley Bassey's first London gig. So I was like, wow okay and I said well do you want to do you want to see the set before you go home so I had this very magical experience of walking Dinah Rigg through an empty soundstage onto the Café de Paris set and she at first said um oh my god this is amazing oh it looks exactly like it was tell your production designer he did an amazing job and then there was that dot 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 where they sort of like you know that like another part of the story is coming and she said I remember walking down those stairs and lots of roomy eyed men looking me up and down and feeling like a piece of meat. And I got in the car and kind of went back home. And I just thought like, she just like summed up the entire movie. Like sort of, it was very sort of, and I don't think she was even thinking about it in, in connection to the script, but it was very sort of profound to me to just hear her say that. Um, so, it's, and it also just, I guess the other thing I was, why I brought this up, because I want, you know, Chrissy has, a, you know, her own experiences coming to London. The other thing that's interesting to me in terms of one of the things that inspired me was that there were a lot of those movies in the 60s about girls coming to London. Yes. And most of them written and directed by men, and a lot of them in a very moralistic way, seeming to like slap the wrist of the younger generation. So it kind of felt that they were quite punitive movies that like girl comes to London and wants to be a star and gets roundly like punished for her efforts. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was like, I saw a lot of those movies and I thought that was fascinating. And I think like you said, is like the sort of the, the perception of the sixties is that they were permissive and progressive. But the reality was, is that lots of old men took advantage of that. Exactly. Sorry, I was I went on a, a big tangent. I was what is no, no. I love anytime I get to hear a story about Dana Rigg, I'm I'm perfectly content. Yeah, please. Um I mean for me, you know, I was 22 when I moved to London and I much like Ailey, like I hadn't come from the country, I'd come from Glasgow, which is kind of a different world. Mm. And then moving to London, you know, with the hopes of, of being a screenwriter. And that worked out and I'm really pleased about it. But you know, there was like no guarantee. And I worked in a bar and I lived above a strip club. And, and I like, you know, used to kind of, uh, my door to get into my flat was like on the strip club, like under the sign. And there was two bouncers that used to like turn men away because people would try and follow me up the stairs. I would like have to like make sure the door was shut behind me. Like it was, you know, if, you, if you're out and about Soho at one o'clock in the morning and you're a woman on your own, you're noticed. Uh, and then the other thing about it was 
the bar that I worked in was great and I and I was very protected there and I was looked after and they were in my London family I actually took the owners to the premiere in London it was great and they've got tremendous stories because the the owner Carol she used to date one of the Rolling Stones in the 60s so she was like such a wealth of knowledge to like that era but there was also like some of the customers that would frequent the bar had been there since the 60s mm-hmm. and, and had lived through kind of like these times and had worked in all different areas. And then of course there were still sex workers in London in Soho when I was there, which you know would be a few years ago now, but it still existed. And there used to be a dominatrix that worked across from the bar and she would come in after every shift and tell us about her clients. And so it was like really <laughs> as a 22 year old, fairly tame, like Scottish person, it was quite like an eye-opening experience to be thrust into this world and to walk by, you know, alleyways and to walk by like, you know, you know, these closes that go up into houses that have models written on them and stuff like that. So yeah, that my, my experience was like right next to the glossy kind of like showbiz editing suites and, and like, you know, seeing famous people on the streets, you would also see prostitutes. You would also see this like undercover world. And I think when Edgar first told me about that story, I thought, oh, that's the perfect, because Soho is a character in itself in the story and it needs to breathe. It needs to be allowed to be seen to be the very didactic thing that it is. And so that that was the very first thing that hooked me as someone who loved Soho and also hated it. Yes. Well, that's, that's really a kind of uh, feeling you get in the movie with Ellie because it represents her sense of pursuing her dream and her mother's. Um, as well, but uh, but also this this uh, this sense of like like not wanting to be there at the same time, really really not wanting to be there, um, but uh, but knowing that there, that it's got that that place is going to hold something for her, and I love that it goes into her work as well. I mean, don't we love that, where our hauntings go into the work that we make. Um, My God, you guys, I love this movie so much that I could talk forever. And thank you for like showing color in a film again. I thought I'd never Ah. see color return. (laughs) I just was like, oh my God, I can see everything that the actors are doing. It's lit and it's got lots of color. Yay. No more all the green scenes. (laughs) I was just one, my my tribute to kind of 60s Eastman color and Technicolor. Yeah. It works, dude. It works. Uh, Thank you. I love the movie. I can't wait to see it again and probably again and again. And I'm going to get the that vinyl, that double vinyl will be out soon. I'll get you one. You get a free one, Alison. Come on. (laughs) I mean, let me just say this. It's a good job that you like the movie because but because because you have a thanks credit, it'll be on your IMDb forever. So thank God you like it. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah <laughs> bragging rights oh lovely lovely time you guys thank you so much thank, thank you so can't wait to meet you christy yeah see you soon good luck with this fabulous movie that was great <laughs>